Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We, more people are joining the session, so we wait a few seconds before we start. <laughs> Hey, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining this third session of the large thermal heat storage webinar series. Uh, we are very happy that you joined this session. And today we will speak about pit storage. My name is Bas Godsvalk. I'm working at IF Technology as business developer. And uh, I'm very happy that I may host this uh, session. Uh, the webinars are supported by RVO and uh, TKI Urban Energy. And the program is launched from the IEA, Energy Storage Task 39, which is a group who has investigated more on heat storage. Uh, some guidelines for this uh, webinar. We have disabled all your cameras and mics. Um, if you have any question, please, you can find a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And there you can drop your questions during the session. And we will try to answer them uh, during the presentations. And they will also become available afterwards. Uh, the chat function is not working. And also, when you raise your digital hands, we will not respond on it. Uh, all the webinars, this one, but also the previous one and the next one will be recorded, so you can uh, listen to them afterwards. Uh, we are also working on the fact sheets of the four technologies, which are uh, our major focus during the sessions, and they will become available again. Thank you very much. And Let's go to the next slide. Um, we are in the middle of the heat transition. So we have discussed this point already before. And in this heat transition, we have a gap between the heat supply and the heat demand. So therefore we need heat storage. And in the first session, we dive into the high temperature ATIS systems. And uh, last week in the borehole thermal energy storage systems. And for today, we look at uh, the pit thermal energy storage system. And next week, it will be the tank storage. The key objectives and the subtasks are described in this presentation. You can read them afterwards because we want to move on to the next slides where we have all the partners who are joining the task 39. Agenda for today. Um, First, our first speaker is Morton von Bobach. He will start to introduce the pit storage technology, give some history and an overview. And then after a short Q&A session, Jonas Sorensen will go about the integration of pit storage. And then at the end, uh, I will say some words about upcoming events, which are also related to this subject. So for now, the first speaker will be Morten von Bobach. He has a master degree in mechanical engineering and is the founder of the company Bobach Solutions. The company offers consultant and engineering services within renewable district heating systems and product design with a special focus on large scale energy storages. Morten is worldwide one of the most experienced individuals within pit storage, pit thermal energy storage. And he's been involved in a majority of large scale storages that have been realized in Denmark and abroad for 15 years. Morten will present the concept and basic principles of pit storage, as well as the experience in this technology. And as inventor of the patented floating concept system, he can also give us more insight in technical and legal aspects. Morten, please share your screen. Um, we are very interested to your story. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you for the for the kind introduction. I'll try to share my screen here. I hope this works. Okay. Perfect. Again, 
thank you very much for the for the introductions. Uh, there's no no need for for further introduction. I think uh, just a few lines on uh, on what uh, uh, my company specializes in, and just a few uh, lines on of the fundamentals. But uh, nothing that we'll dive deeper into into for now. Uh, what I would like to emphasize uh, on this uh, slide is the is the table of the existing large scale thermal energy storages in uh, in Denmark. Uh, if we look at the, the three uh, first storages, they are more or less uh, test storages, pit thermal energy storages, or pilot storages. If we then go into the, the first full-scale storage, storage that was uh, established as a pit thermal energy storage in Denmark, uh, this one in, uh, in Master, which I was a uh, project manager uh, on that project at that time in 2012, and the same for the next one in uh, Dorning Lund in 2013. Uh, then these three storages, Gamm, Voins and Toft Lund, uh, I was not directly involved in the implementation of these projects, uh, but I was involved in the feasibility studies and also in the, um, in the improvement of the insulation of the cover in the storage in Gamm in, uh, in in, in a few years ago. Uh, as you see, the, the storage in Voyens is so far the, the world's biggest uh, pit thermal energy storage with almost 200,000 cubic meters of storage capacity. Uh, then uh, I also have mentioned here the one storage in, uh, in Tibet. It's obviously not a Danish storage, but it was a Danish project supplied by a Danish company. And also in that project, I was responsible for the, both the feasibility study um, the design of the storage and also the implementation of the storage as a size site manager in Tibet at the time. The last one here on the list is uh, the one uh, built recently in Hoyatostop, which is uh, just outside Copenhagen. Uh, this storage of 70,000 cubic meters is a little bit interesting because the other storages are all connected to um, to um, to solar heating plants or solar plants uh, and acting more or less as seasonal storages. But this one uh, in Hoytostop is actually a weekly or daily buffer storage, which is connected to the district heating network in Copenhagen. Um, and this is definitely something that we're going to see a lot more in the future. And it's also something that puts some other demands on the storages. But we'll get back to back to that. Just to complete the list, I've also mentioned uh, the one borehole storage we have in uh, in Denmark connected to a district heating system, where I was also the a project manager and involved in the planning and design of this project. And the last storage I want to mention is the only aquifer storage we have in Denmark connected to uh, to a district heating network. Or yeah, so so you can see in Denmark it's mainly pit thermal energy storages when we talk about these large scale storages. And the last thing I want to emphasize is that, uh, or as already mentioned, that I was responsible for the development, the certification, and implementation of this new cover technology that has been used for the pit thermal energy storages being built uh, recently in, in Denmark. Uh, there are some articles on, on this topic. Uh, one of them is, uh, you can see here, uh, this Hot Cool magazine, where you can read more about the, the background for this new cover technology and also some of the perspectives in, in that respect. So just to mention some of the few, some of the projects that I was involved in, this one uh, is the one uh, that was involved in first in, in Marstal, but it had its cover replaced in uh, 2019, uh, which I was also responsible for. You can see here in the lower photos uh, how the storage look today with the new cover and the top photos are just some some photograph from the implementation of the of this cover when it was replaced in 2019-20. The next one I want to mention is the project in, in Tibet, which was also a very interesting uh, pit thermal energy storage project. You can see here the picture in the, the upper left corner. Uh, the excavation of the storage has been, been completed. You can see here below uh, the liner installation is uh, in progress. And if you then look uh, on, on the top right and uh, next to it, the, the foundation for the diffuser pipes and, and the upper right here, the diffuser itself uh, in the storage during the water filling of the storage. Here in this picture, you can see the, the storage has been filled with water and ready for the installation of the cover. And, and the last picture here, you see the overall 
complete plant with uh, 15,000 cubic meters of pit storage, 22,000 square meters of solar collectors. And this combination actually supplies more than 90% of the yearly heat demand of a village in a village called Lankashi in Tibet. And the rest, the remaining 10% supplied by electrical boilers. That is quite interesting and quite nice because this is a village in an altitude of almost 5,000 meters above sea level. So there is no infrastructure for natural gas or, or anything else. If you have to bring up fuel or you have to drive several thousand kilometers and um, and also there's no biomass available because of the high altitude. So so that's that's a quite nice way of of producing heat for for the local uh, for the local people there. Stepping a little bit back and and looking uh, at uh, the the basic principles of uh, a pit storage. It is very simple uh, in general because what you do is that you just excavate a large hole in the ground, so to say an artificial lake. You then use the soil that you excavate as embankments around the hole or around the lake to kind of increase the, the volume of the, the storage. So you actually effectively get more volume of the storage than what you need to handle of the soil. And ideally, you, uh, you use uh, the same amount of soil in the embankments as you take out from the excavation. So you don't have to get rid of any soil from the, from the site and you don't have to add any additional soil to the site. And that's one of the things that makes it very cost efficient. Preferably, we want to make them as deep as possible because then we lower the, the then we increase the size of the stars compared to the surface area. So we have a more efficient land usage, and we have less surface area for the for the cover, which is was one of the most uh, costly uh, parts of the of the storage. Um, Normally, what uh, what um, the the limitation is normally the distance to the groundwater table, and that can of course in in uh, some places be a be a, a limit, and especially in the Netherlands, I guess, uh, where we have I guess almost all over the country a quite high level of groundwater, but you are not really uh, bonded to this uh, geometry. You you can choose to make the embankments higher and make less volume of uh, of the storage below uh, the original surface so so you can adjust something but of course it has an impact on the cost effectiveness in reality it looks something like this this is a photograph from uh, from uh, Dorning Lund uh, before we uh, made the storage in Dorning Lund and here on the right side you have a photograph of this of the same area after the excavation is done and we actually started installing the the diffuser to charge and and discharge the storage after the excavation is done, we install, uh, to, to make the storage watertight, we install this kind of uh, polymer liner, which is typically a HDPE, a DU membrane that is welded together, as you see on the other picture here, with this kind of welding equipment. There are some different ways uh, and measures to, to test the, the watertightness of the storage, so you make sure that, uh, that it is 100% watertight when it's finished. I will not go into to detail with this. Then with the, when the liner is installed, you fill the storage with, uh, with pure water and then you install a floating uh, insulated floating cover on top of the water surface to protect the, the storage against heat loss, to minimize the heat loss and also to protect the, the storage against the environment. So in the end, it, it could look uh, something like this. I, I will get back to some more details on this uh, cover construction. You need to be able to charge and discharge the storage, obviously, and you do that by by the help of uh, diffusers, pipe connections, and heat exchangers. This is a picture of uh, the diffuser in the project in Tibet. Actually, uh, this is taken during the water initial water filling. So, in in the end, the water surface will be above the diffuser, and the insulated cover will be on top of that. And here you see the foundation or the inlet to the from from the pipes to the diffusers. Uh, don't be uh, confused about the details in, in this uh, schematics. It's, it's the schematics from the project in Tibet. And we have uh, heat being produced by a solar plant. We have our pit storage and we have a district heating network that we supply heat to. So when the solar plant produces more heat than we need in, um, in the city, in the district heating network, then the surplus heat will be supplied to the top of the pit heat storage. Uh, and then we extract cold water from the bottom of the, the pit storage, which is then 
sent to the solar plant and, and heated up again by the solar collectors. Then during the, the winter or during the night, when we have more consumption to the, to the city than we produce from the solar plants, then we start to extract hot water from the top of the storage, send it to the district heating network, and the cold water that we get back from the district heating return pipes is then feed into the bottom of the storage. So then we have this separation, you could say, in the storage between the, the hot uh, water in the top of the storage and the cold water in the, in the bottom part of the storage. And we are able to maintain this separation because uh, cold water has a higher density than the hot water. So if we are careful and do not uh, do any mixing of the uh, excessive mixing of the water in the storage, we are able to maintain this, uh, this uh, distinction between the hot and cold water. Um, so let's move to the next one. Just to mention some of the attention points when, uh, when we implement uh, these kind of applications, these pity storages. I have always men al already mentioned some of the, the things with the geology and the groundwater table. Uh, we, we Preferably, we want to stay above the groundwater table. We can also go into the to the groundwater table, but we then need to be very much aware of additional heat loss and eventually some um, some requirements from uh, from the municipality uh, to to get uh, to be allowed to to build these kind of projects. We need to typically to document if we are going to heat up the groundwater and how much we are going to heat up the groundwater. And sometimes we also need to measure during the operation if there is any heating of the groundwater um, above a certain level. The, um, the geotechnical consideration involved in a storage like this is, is not much different than when you normally building uh, ordinary dams. So, so that's known technology. Uh, then the next uh, point is the service life of a storage, uh, especially in relation to the temperature that we expose the storage to. And it's it's um, it's mostly related to the liner and the insulation, and I'll get back to that in the next slide. Then there are some attention points regarding corrosion resistance, water quality in the storage, uh, which is mainly related to the diffuser system and the, the pipe connections to the storage. I will also get back to that. Uh, weather impact on installation. Um, I have a few points on that I will present. And then last but not least, the insulated cover itself. Um, this is the the area or the field where we have seen um, most issues in the past, uh, even when we started to build these uh, full-scale storages. So, so that is also so a major attention point, which I will get get slightly back to. So, uh, regarding this temperature issue and the service life of the storages, well, there are two main liner materials used for for the existing storages the one is uh, hdpe or high density polyethylene and the other one is polypropylene uh, the advantage by the hdpe is that we have a lot of experience with this material both from uh, real life applications but also from testing in the laboratory uh, and it's really durable at uh, both cold temperatures and, and high temperatures uh, the the backside of this material is that we know also that if we expose it to very high permanent temperatures, let's say we expose it to 85 degrees constantly, then we expect less than 20 years uh, lifetime of uh, of this. On the other hand, the, the polypropylene uh, has, at least in theory, a higher temperature resistance. So uh, this um, can probably uh, withstand 95 degrees permanently or even higher uh, for at least 25 years. The backside is that we don't have much experience with this material yet. So far, it has only been used in one application, and that is the one that was put into operation last year. Uh, and there's also another disadvantage by this, um, and it is that the poly problem gets brittle at low temperatures. It's not an issue under operation or during operation. But it's something that you need to be very much aware of during the construction of the, the plant because you need to protect it against the, the cold temperatures during installation. Getting back to the, the water quality and corrosion issues, I will not go into detail with this, but we have experience with stainless steel diffuser system, black steel or carbon steel, and coated steel. And uh, just uh, to mention at least my... Um, my point in, in, in this respect is that if you need to be 100% sure that you don't get any corrosion uh, uh, issues, then you need to use uh, stainless steel uh, pipes, stainless steel diffusers. 
and you need to fulfill the requirements for the water quality given in this table. It's more or less the same requirements as uh, you give for water in district heating uh, networks. Uh, there, there can be different opinions on, on this, uh, but at least that, that's my opinion. And the reason that you still need a quite high degree of uh, water treatment, and this can be achieved by uh, treating the water with a reverse osmosis water treatment plant. But these requirements, even though you use, use stainless steel, is still valid because uh, when you have high temperatures and you have uh, high or just a, a low amount of uh, chlorides or a high uh, conductivity, then you risk uh, stress corrosion cracking, uh, even in stainless steel. But if you fulfill these criteria, then, uh, then in my opinion, you are on the safe side. Getting back to this uh, about the um, weather impact on the installation and uh, the need for, for proper planning and coordination. Well, the most um, weather dependent uh, installation uh, in a project like this is the liner installation because it's heavily dependent on both temperature, on moisture and wind condition. And it effectively means that you cannot install a liner during the winter period. And another thing, and that's the reason I brought this, uh, this photo here. Uh, this is from the, the project uh, in Marstall in 2012. Uh, in this case, the, the soil uh, works uh, contractor have uh, did complete uh, almost one entire side of the storage and, and half of this side. Uh, to make it ready for liner installation. But then there was a very heavy rain incident, a cloud burst. And the result was then that the, the site was uh, destroyed. A lot of the soil was flushed down to the bottom of the storage and he more or less had to start start over with the, with preparing the sites for the liner installation. So, so now today we have much more focus on this coordination between the liner installation and the, and the soil work to be able to to install that in a in a proper manner, so he will not, he will just the, the, the soil works contractor will only prepare the surface that can be uh, mounted with liner within one or two days uh, after. And that's of course also other other issues uh, that needs to be planned. So getting back to the to the cover, I mentioned that the cover is the the single component where we saw the most issues in in the past. Uh, and even though this has been developed through many years, uh, we still, even with the with the full scale plants that we have been building since 2012, we still saw some issues. And and uh, that was the reason that we started an R and D project in 2017, and that resulted in a in a new lid design for a pit thermal storage. The two main issues was uh, water accumulation inside the insulation, and rainwater ponding on top of the um, of the storage. Uh, so the first issue um, with the with the water accumulation inside the insulation is due to the fact that even though we consider a polymer liner as a 100% watertight barrier, uh, we have actually at high temperatures, there will be some moisture diffusion through the liner. And if you do not make sure that this moisture that diffuses through the floating liner from the water surface can escape from the, the cover, then you, you have some issues with the uh, moisture building up. So I will not go much into detail with this and because we don't have the time for, for this to, today. Uh, but that is the main reason that we then changed the construction to a diffusion open uh, principle, which is actually based on, um, on uh, some techniques that you also use in traditional building industry in what you call the reversed roof constructions. And the other thing with the, with the problems with the water ponds on top of the surface, it is it is actually it's because we have these huge uh, surface areas where there will be some issues with handling the, the rainwater if it's not handled properly. And the way that it's handled in this new design of the cover is that we separate the surface area of the cover into smaller sections. And then within each individual section, we handle the rainwater by creating a slope on top of the, the surface uh, and adding a, a pump well in the center of each section where we can then pump away the, the rainwater that is collected. It also has some, some other benefits, this sectionized design. Uh, one of them is that uh, when we heat up the water, there will be relief some, some air bubbles from the water, like when you're boiling water at home. And this will be forced towards these section barriers at the storage and can escape through these air winds that we have at the section barriers instead of forming large air balloons uh, below the cover, which we have seen in, in, in previous storages. 
I think probably also interesting for many people the the efficiency of uh, of applications like this. We have some very good uh, measurements from uh, from the storage in Dorning Lund uh, because it was a part of this uh, project that is mentioned uh, down here. Uh, and in this four year period from uh, 14 to 17, we measured uh, that the heat that we could utilize from the storage was more than 90% compared to the heat that we stored or charged to the storage, uh, meaning that the heat loss is, is less than 10% actually uh, through this four year period. I have also uh, shown here the, the temperature development inside the storage for this same four year period. Uh, again, I will not go into detail with it, but the red line is the temperature on the top of the storage. The blue line is the temperature on the bottom of the storage. And we can see here when we have a point where we are fully uh, charged, we have maximum temperatures up to almost 90 degrees. And when we have a fully discharged storage, which will typically be the, in the end of the winter, we have around uh, 10 degrees in the, in the bottom of the storage. Uh, and this last charge is just on a monthly basis. You can see how much do we charge into the storage and how much do we discharge from the storage in the same period. So the last slide, which is probably also interesting for, for a lot of people, is um, a look into the to the cost of uh, these kind of applications. There was another IEA uh, task um, where we made this guideline for design of seasonal pit heat storages. Uh, I was the author of the original version, but it was updated in 2020 with, among other this uh, this uh, chart for the for the estimation of the cost of a pit heat storage. And what I want to emphasize with this chart is that um, you can really see that when the storages grow bigger and bigger, you increase the cost effectiveness of the storages. So the specific cost for each cu cubic meters of storage volume or each megawatt hour of, of, uh, of heat content, you uh, decrease the, the cost. And but again, also be aware that this, this chart is uh, a few years old already. If I do a recent price calculation of a large scale storage, let's say 600,000 cubic meters, then, uh, well, at, in, in the end, I would say you should expect at least, the cost would be at least 30% above this chart that you see here. Uh, and the main reason for that is that we saw significant increases in raw material prices uh, in this period, and also labor costs and other things has, has gone up. But still, this, this price is uh, still very competitive against, uh, for instance, uh, steel tanks or, or yeah, tank storages, uh, where they are, I would say, at least or around five times more expensive than, than this level. So thank you very much for, um, for, for your time. And uh, yes, enjoy this uh, photo of the, the storage in Donning Lund and uh, feel free to ask questions of, of any kind. Thank you very much, uh, Morten. And indeed, this is a very nice uh, place. I've been there too, uh, if I remember well. <laughs> so thank you very much. Um, I have seen that there are a couple of questions uh, in the Q&A, and so we were not able to answer them. So I think it will be very useful to to bring them on the table, David, um, yeah. to just go a few questions, I think. Yeah, perfect. Uh, and we won't be able to answer all of the questions. So, Morten, the, the ones we don't answer now, it'd be nice if you could answer them uh, in a bit via the via the chat. Um, sure. Thanks for your presentation, Morten. Uh, one question that if I sort of summarize it or one topic uh, that pops up is, is uh, people, at least uh, the Dutch participants, are, are curious if, yeah, PTES is interesting for the Netherlands. And uh, and and what are the really the things that need to be that we need to be aware of? You kind of touched upon it already a little bit in your presentation, but in a way, could you also say a little bit of, about the risks? But also, what could be the added value, and and what what are sort of attention points there? Well, I guess the a, a pit storage in general is very comparable uh, in an operational point of view to a, view to a tank storage. So that means we can we can utilize the same uh, temperature levels as we have in steel tank or tank storages. We have the same uh, kind of um, possibilities to to make rapid uh, charging and discharging, uh, reverse the flow, uh, go from charging to discharging within a, within a very short time. 
Uh, of course, the, the the limitations is of course, uh, as I mentioned in in the in the geology. Um, if uh, we have um, if we are in an area where we have a lot of groundwater, and especially if we have uh, flowing uh, groundwater with with relatively high flow velocities, then there is a risk that we have additional heat loss uh, to this. As I also mentioned, there are some possibilities to adapt to to that. Uh, you can make the the storage higher and not go as deep in in the ground. Uh, then I think, especially for the for for the Dutch conditions, um, you need to be very aware. If if you make you know already that in 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 the Netherlands, if you make high dams, you maybe have some problems with the stability of the subsoil. Uh, so that's something that you need to take into account. Uh, but I guess that's some that's um, that's a technology that is already real, well known in. Uh, in, in the country, it just needs to be adapted to another application. Yeah, uh, interesting. Mm -hmm. Then you also mentioned all the the chances or the possibilities or maybe ways to work with the situation or with the environment. But also, uh, clearly, th these these are things that need to be taken into account. Um, is there another uh, kind of relating a little bit to your question, and it's also popped up a few times. Obviously, stratification is something which is yeah, which is a core component of the design. Is there is there a minimum depth uh, that that is required to really ensure that this stratification or in the best way? Um, that also kind of relates to that question, like how deep do you put it? How high do you have to make it? Uh, also for the Dutch context. Mm. That that's a that's a very good uh, question actually because it's something that we have. Uh... We have investigated a, a lot, obviously, and of course, in the beginning, uh, when you see this shape of the storage, where you have much um, more width uh, compared to the height, uh, if you if you compare to steel tanks, you you could suspect that the, that there would be some issues with the um, with the stratification. Uh, but we made a lot of measurements because we have in in all the storages we have um, temperature sensors at least for each uh, half a meter. So we have a lot of documentation in this respect, and and it's not something that we uh, that we really see as an as an issue. Of course, uh, if we have a stratification layer of let's let's just say one meter or let's say two meter, uh, that's much more volume that you have in this stratification layer compared to if you would have a very narrow and and high or tall storage. Um, but it, it's not like that that the stratification layer has. Um, um, at a larger height compared to uh, to, to tanks. That's, that's not our experience, at least. All right, interesting. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much, uh, David and Martin. I'm very sorry, but we have to yep. move on to the next speaker. Uh, yeah. Very interesting questions. Maybe, Martin, you can also have a look at the Q&A. There are a couple of questions which are maybe specific also to your presentation. So maybe you can ask them there during uh, the next uh, half an hour. Uh, then I'll do my best. Thank you. I'm supposed to go to, to Jonas Ilum Sorensen. Um, he is a product manager at Alborg CSP, which is an EPC company that engineers and builds energy systems for district heating, industry, and elect electricity production. He manages the pitch thermal energy storage products where he leads the development and our participation in research projects like Task 39. He also takes on the role as an energy system architect, where he designs integrated energy systems with heat pumps, PV, solar panels, uh, electric boilers, and power to X, and thermal and electricity storage. Um, in the presentation, he will go and dive more into the design and integration of these systems. So Jonas, please. Thank you a lot for that nice introduction. I will share my screen and uh, then I will get going. Yes, please. <clears throat> and of course, turn on uh, turn on my video. And then, as we uh, discussed, let me know if the uh, audio quality suffers. Then I will turn off the video. It works right fine now. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. Great. So I assume that you can see my screen now. Uh, where it says that we, we at Alba CSP uh, have the goal of changing energy with renewables technologies. And that is a broad term, but that means that 
what we do is that that uh, we use a lot of different technologies in our system designs to deliver the minimum cost of heat for the client. That is the ultimate goal. Um, so, of course, since I am uh, very fond of the uh, of the PTES, I would uh, love to see more of those around. <laughs> um, but 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 just as you have heard previously in these webinars, there are different storages for thermal energy, and depending on the on the situation, depending on the given case, some of them will be relevant and some of them will not be relevant. So the same goes with the pizzas. There is a lot of cases where it does not make sense to do it. And there is a lot of cases where it does make sense to do it. So yeah, the vision that we have is to help uh, develop uh, new energy systems that can transition us away from coal, from coal and, and natural gas and oil and so on towards a more green and sustainable uh, future, especially for the district heating system, as as the heating and cooling uh, demand across Europe, really across the world, uh, is 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 roughly half or roughly fifty percent of the energy that we consume. So so it is a big a big market that if we can just change it a little bit, it will have a huge impact. We work across the globe. We work in, in mainly in Denmark and Europe, but uh, we also go overseas. We go to Australia, we go to, to Africa, the Middle East, and so on, um, um, wherever the, the, the clients and the projects they take us, uh, there we will go. And as I have already mentioned, we have a wide variety of, of businesses. Um, we have the district heating segment, which I am part of, and that comprises the thermal energy storage, solar district heating, heat pumps. Um, then we also have for electricity production, uh, we have integrated energy systems where we have com uh, concentrated solar power. Um, we develop heat exchanges for, for these kind of applications, but also for power to X applications and so on. Um, and then we have a lot of research and development activities in EU funded projects where we help develop the, the, uh, the technology of tomorrow. And then we also do after sales and service. So we can really take uh, um, a project from the initial phase, the, 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 uh, the idea phase where you want to do research and development through feasibility study to assess how big should the components be? What is the best type of heat pump? Uh, should there be a storage? And how large should that be? And which type of storage? All the way through the detailed design, we do procurement and manufacturing. We do installation of the equipment. Um, and then at the end, we do operation and maintenance as well. So, Enough of the company stuff. Uh, now to the pizzas. So, so the goal of having a storage, no matter like if you have a pizzas, you have a tank, aquifer, borehole. What it gives you is that it gives you flexibility and it gives you security of supply. Those two um, properties are very valuable, but also very difficult to put a price tag on. So. The overall target here is to minimize the cost of heat. And through storages, we can do that. If we look um, not into the uh, far distant future, but oh, like, like to tomorrow, to next year, to the next couple of years, we will see that, that our district heating grid will change. We, will, we are trying to lower the temperature, the forward temperature uh, um, while increasing the efficiency, all the while that we are phasing out these uh, uh, fossil fuel based heat sources. So we're doing a lot of things and, and that requires us to broaden the technologies that we use. That means that it, in order to get to that point, we need to 
look at using surplus electricity. We need to looking at at the um, um, sustainable biomass, heat storages, surplus of energy from industrial processes and so on. That means that we have a lot of different heat sources. Instead of one central component, we have a lot of different heat sources spread out. Each of them will run at specific times of the year, at specific times of the day, because some of them will have very variable heat prices. Just think about if you have an electric boiler, which you want to use when the electricity price drops to a certain level, that that operation pattern will be look completely random. Um, so you will have heat at very specific points in time. And at those times, you want to produce as much heat as possible. But if that does not uh, um, correlate with your demand of heat, then it doesn't matter if you produce the heat. So in order to bridge that gap, you need to have a storage. So we see the storage as as becoming the central component in the future district heating energy systems. And also, if we look at the waste heat, so here you see a map. It well, is- May I uh, interrupt at... you briefly? Uh, maybe it's yep. better to switch off your camera. There is a little bit uh, okay. extra yep. noise. Let's uh, do that. We can, we can hear you clearly, but there is some extra noise. Yep. So maybe that helps. Uh, thank you. Great, great, yeah. So here you see a map where we, uh, so it's a bit dated, don't mind that, but the idea here is that you see um, you see waste heat or heat that can be collected, so so accessible heat really that is uh, below 50 degrees Celsius, so a low low quality heat for use in district heating really, um, but there is a lot here here there is roughly 10% of the entire uh, heat demand in Europe that we can collect from factories, from from yeah from production lines, from wastewater facilities and so on. But the temperature here is is too low to be used directly. And and uh, well, then we can boost the temperature with a heat pump, you might say, and that is completely true. But some of these heat sources are very seasonal. They are. Uh, rapidly changing, for example, a data center, which needs cooling and thereby produces some excess heat. Uh, um, the amount of heat that the data center produce is very variable. Um, um, and if you connect a heat pump directly to that, the heat pump is like, it will not be able to follow along because uh, it needs to change or to change how it how it operates very rapidly to accommodate the heat, uh, uh, the cooling for the data center. But if you, instead of connecting the uh, heat pump directly to the data center, for example, it could also be a, 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 a factory, you put in a storage in between, you create this buffer where you decouple the variable cooling demand from the stable district heating supply. So that is that is what we see as being the future. Right now, the pizzas that we see are are in two categories. Really, we have the seasonal thing where you have typically solar thermal. It could also be that you have a pizzas connected to a a, a a waste incineration that 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 can produce um, that can produce excess heat during summer, but not in the winter. But then you can store heat during the summer from the waste incineration and you can use it in the winter. That is also completely fine. It could also be a weekly storage, more as what we see just outside of Copenhagen, where uh, um, it is used more, more as a steel tank or you, uh, where you do uh, daily charges and discharges. Uh, yesterday, I actually talked to the um, talked to the, uh, uh, um, um, the, the director at the Tostov uh, District Heating Company. And she told me that, that uh, they are really using it on a daily basis. They are using it just as a steel tank. And, and their projections is that, they re that uh, re the return of investment here is 10 years due to this. 
because you are able to remove the the um, the, the the peak production heat units. You can reduce those or completely remove them, and thereby save a lot of cost by just taking the heat from the storage for your peak hours, for example. That provides a lot of uh, um, revenue, which which in Denmark at least means that the consumers will will be able to get the heat cheaper because it has to be net zero. Uh, uh, um, they cannot make a profit and so on. So for the consumers there, it means that they get cheaper heat simply by having a storage just at the outskirts of the town. Um, I think Morton has already shown this, uh, the master case and uh, the Dawning Lund as well. Um, I will just move quickly through those slides. You will, all, you will also see them here. Just to show you, you don't have to dive into the details here. Uh, um, what you need to look at, and sorry for it being in Danish, <laughs> um, but but uh, at least you can see the pizzas here. And this is a case where you have, if I can find my cursor here, where you have solar heating, so solar collectors. So it means that you have as Martin showed, you have different diffusers at different heights. You can put in heat at different heights and you can take out heat at different heights inside the storage. And then you can supply it to the district heating and, and, and uh, thereby you can store the heat for use in the winter um, when you have the excess in the summer. That is the original idea. That was the original idea for the pizzas. If we move to uh, Hoy Tostop here, outside of Copenhagen, uh, they anticipated 25 cycles per year. Uh, according to the uh, director yesterday, the CEO, uh, she said that that number is way higher. Uh, um, she wouldn't give me a, a, a number, but she said that 25 is, is fairly low. <laughs> um, but that is, of course, because you, you really you only get to see the real benefit of the storage once you have it. There you get to see the flexibility and and the uh, and the um, the the, the uh, security of supply that it gives you. And thereby you can begin to optimize your entire district heating system around the storage. But that only that is possible because in the pizzas you can have very high discharge and charge rates. You can go, for example, here, in uh, the one close to Copenhagen, they have 30 megawatt of charge and discharge. You can also design it to have 50, to have 100. Uh, um, that depends on the diffusers, the pipes, heat exchanges, the pumps, and so on. But it is possible to design this charge and discharge rate just as how you like it. I want to show this short animation here. Um, I apologize if it is a bit uh, lacking. Um, it usually is when we do these uh, uh, um, like online meetings, uh, but you get the presentation afterwards, and I hope that you will be able to view it on your own. Um, the idea is that um, you have a lot of different heat sources, just as I, just um, as I said in the beginning, and at certain points during the year, it makes sense to use them because they will produce. Uh, 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 the cheapest heat, you input the excess to the storage, and when none of the heat sources really produce like at a favorable price, you can use from the storage. It could also be in the peak time, uh, the peak hours. So the idea is to have this storage as the central component and build your district heating system around that. If you have an existing heat district heating system, which you most likely have, then the idea is to think about how do we best integrate the storage so that we optimize the production units that we already have. The idea is, is to, to uh, give you the most flexibility and, and, and the lowest cost of heat. That is the purpose of the storage. Here, um, it's a German case. Uh, it's a bit more complicated than the last one, uh, but don't worry. Um, it's actually, the principle is fairly simple here. 
uh, because it's just how you saw in the movie just before. Um, when there's an when electricity is cheap, that could be the case. That's not like always the case, and that is not always the case for all countries. We are just from Denmark, where it happens to occur quite a lot. Uh, when we have days with low electricity prices, it could also be that 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 you are coupled to the uh, gas market, and at certain points, gas is cheap. You run the uh, the the the, the uh, uh, gas boiler. It could also be for biomass. It could be for different things. It's just that the heat sources varies, and thereby the price will vary. And I I think that in in the coming years we will see that that the district heating market or the price for heating in district heating systems will become much more like the electricity market. It will begin to vary a lot more. And if if you want to supply uh, uh, um, heat to your customers at a stable price, which they would love, um, then storages are a central component to that. So here, if we say that we have solar thermal, we have an electric boiler, and we have a heat pump. Let's look at that. If the electricity price is low during summer, we will also have solar thermal that are producing. So we may have solar thermal we and have uh, uh, um, solar PV. The solar PV will produce electricity for the electric boiler. Um, and we have solar thermal. And then the the heat that we cannot use, we can supply to the storage. At the same time, we can take some of the uh, um, the lukewarm water inside the pizzas and cool that out to provide a cold bottom in the pizzas while providing heat to the to the city through a heat pump. That enables us to use the bottom of the pizzas for cooling. It could, for example, be for a uh, data center. It could be for power to x It could be for a factory or just for a district cooling system. The idea here is that that if you have solar thermal and you have PV, for example, their production peaks will happen at the same days. And when your PV facility provides uh, uh, um, provides a lot of electricity, it means that the neighbor's PV systems will also do that. So most likely the electricity price is fairly low and therefore it makes more sense to convert that ele electricity to heat and then store it inside your pizzas for future use. You have almost one minute left. <clears throat> yeah, I'm uh, almost done. So it's perfect. The last point here is really that uh, it means that the the energy inside the pieces will change during the year. You will have a lot of spikes and lows and so on. It can also be a combination of all of these, these things where you have a partly seasonal and a partly daily storage. And the last point, uh, since we are supplier of the lid, uh, the lid that we supply shows no buildup of moisture, no rainwater puddles. And the heat loss, just as Martin said, is below 10% and a lifetime of minimum 25 years. And uh, due to all of these unfortunate events, we have gotten it certified by Lloyd's Register so that they are supporting the claims that we make. Some of them you see here on the screen right now. That was it. Thank you very much, Jonas. Also a very interesting presentation, and I think it gives us a lot of more insight about pit storage, which is not so familiar technology in the Netherlands. Um, I think it will be good that we have uh, give you a few questions because there were uh, questions also during the sessions. Yeah. So David, can you yeah, and, and feel feel free to turn on your camera now, uh, Jonas. I think and now the presentation's over. Uh... And, and more than as well. <laughs> and also, uh, then we can also have you a little bit in the viewing here. Um, uh, thanks for the presentation. It was really uh, good to follow uh, and uh, and and clear. Um, I um, uh, there were indeed a few questions that popped up, um, mm -hmm. and there is also uh, and there is also a thing, few things that I also was wondering as I was uh, popped up inside me when I was. Uh, listening to your presentation and one of the first things that i 
I got I was triggered by your story about um the 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 storage which was built and designed and then when you asked about their experiences they ended up using it more than they anticipated mm -hmm. um and i was actually curious about that uh, do you, have you heard more such stories that that people end up using their storage so, more than expected or more than initially designed is it yeah does that happen more often yeah. for for example, and I think uh, uh, Martin also supplied that point, uh, the storage in Donilon, actually the one I showed on the last uh, slide that was blurred out, is a seasonal storage. And and in your mind, when you hear that and when you learn about that, it means that you, you charge during the summer and discharge during the winter, which would imply that you have one cycle, you have one charge, and one discharge, but that is really not the case at their facility. They also use it during the summer because during summer you have days where the sun does not shine. You still need heat. It might be uh, some cold rainy days. We have those uh, 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 for some part of the summer in Denmark. So when you look throughout the year, they have what typically between two and 2.5 uh, cycles, meaning that they, they charge what is equivalent to, to uh, 2 to 2.5 uh, times the amount of capacity of the storage. So they also use it more. They use it as sort of a, you could call it a hybrid thing between the seasonal and and the uh, your weekly storage. Of course, more towards the seasonal side. So um, the technology here is like the difference between the seasonal and the weekly storage in terms of the construction and so on, there is not really any major difference. There might there, there will be differences if you have different temperature requirements. As Morten said, you have something for the liner if you want to go to 85 to 90 degrees and so on. But despite that, it's more or less the same product. There will be differences in the uh, uh, design of the diffusers due to the size of them charge and discharge rate and the associated pumps and heat exchanges and valves and pipes and all of that but the pizzas will more or less be the same cool yeah so thanks. that is why you can start out with having uh, 25 cycles per year but then realize well what if i go to 40 cycles per year well you can do that because the product is the same yeah nice well i i, I... I especially like the message, uh, you know, build it and then experience it as well and see yeah. <laughs> the added value, see the added function of it. I, I I really like that. That's a nice message, in my opinion, for for the Netherlands. So uh, it's a it's an interesting one to hear uh, for for us viewers here. I think. Um, uh, yeah, last, uh, last short question and yeah. short answer also. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. Sure. Then I'll then I'll ask more of a short question. There is a bit of a longer one, uh, but uh, though we'll uh, we'll also be answering questions uh, afterwards as well. Um, and then a question: Do you do? Are there also examples? And this is also something I was wondering, where the lids have a dual purpose, um, uh, as in that you build something atop of it yes. or that you put something else atop of it so that it's more yeah. than just a lid. Are there yeah, examples? That is, uh, I would say uh, that is the number one question that I get. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, I imagine. But, but, but now I have an answer to it. <laughs> and, <laughs> all right. And, uh, and, and that is that, that uh, due to all of the requests, we have, we have uh, applied for a patent uh, for a, uh, a mounting system for PV panels on top. Cool. Of course, there is some restrictions to how large proportion of the area that you can use and all of that. There are details about it. But the, the short answer is, yes, that is possible. For now, only with PV. And yes, you can also... Uh, go towards a a a, a uh, green lid if you uh, desire to have it uh, biodiverse instead. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Thank so, you guys very much for presenting, uh, Jonas and Morten and David. Also bringing up the questions. Uh, due to the time reason, we just have to go to the last announcement of uh, the next uh, sessions uh, because next week there will be. Uh, a new uh, two sessions, uh, one on December uh, 14th 
of the energy storage TCP. Uh, you can here see the link uh, if you want to join it. And then after that session, you can join again our webinar series where we will go into detail about tank storage. Uh, and we have two speakers who will explain more about that topic. Uh, from RVO, we were also mentioned that on Wednesday, 28th of February next year, there is a Geothermica event in Offenburg in Germany, just one day before the, the symposium and uh, um, will be there. So, and on March 28th, uh, we will have a Dutch symposium dealing about uh, high temperature ATA system. So more information about the geothermal and geothermica uh, workshop that's in Offenburg. Uh, you can see the details here. And if you want to announce yourself, please follow the link. And then I will close the session by saying that if you want to know more about the TCP energy storage, you can contact Stan van der Broek. Um, then I would thank you all for joining and hope to see you next week. Uh, about the tank storage. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Maybe uh, good to mention that the slides will also be uh, sent afterwards. So uh, the links that Bus was talking about, you'll be able to click uh, click via that yes. way. Perfect. Cool. Thank, you. Thank you very much, uh, everybody. Okay. Bye. bye.